Good morning and a happy and blessed Sabbath to everyone. May God richly bless you as you worship with us today. Our thought for meditation is taken from Ellen G. White's writings, Sons and Daughters, page 29. Every servant of God is to be guided by the Holy Spirit. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Our path, however rugged it may be, is marked out for us by the Lord, and in it we must walk. Christ has made a provision that his church shall be tra a transformed body, illumined with the light of heaven, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. It is his purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace. May this reading be a blessing to us all. Walked along the shore one day Saw the ocean full of debris Looked into my troubled thoughts Reflections of the sea I see The water worked so soft Arranging the debris on the land But when I turn around I saw an amazing view on the sand Yes, I see I clearly see Pretty patterns on the sand Show to me God's wonderful plan With the Spirit in my life I have a part Deep in my heart In God's great love And wonderful plan Walked along the shore one day Saw the ocean full of debris Looked into my troubled thoughts Reflections of the sea I see But like the water the Holy Spirit still works in me Who turned my shattered, broken life To work of art the world can see Now they will see Yes, they will see Pretty patterns on the sand Show to me God's wonderful plan With the Spirit in my life I have a part Deep in my heart In God's great love And wonderful plan Looking back to what I've done I've strayed away and let go of God's hand Without Him I'm debris Uselessly adrift on life's sea Pretty patterns all 
show to me God's wonderful plan with a spirit in my life I have a part deep in my heart in God's great love and wonderful plan Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask for wisdom. We ask for strength. For the health of our mind and for the health of our body. Only then can we wisely discern and properly worship you in spirit and in truth. In today's atmosphere that is rife with deception and conflicts and people are deceived. I pray that today and from this day on in the study of this subject, we all will strive to enter that straight and narrow way, which in this study shows us that we must be able to possess the mind of Christ so that we can choose the right way and the strength of body so that we can remain in that way which ends in eternity when Christ comes. So bless us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to continue this uh, wonderful subject of sound mind and sound body with these verses from Matthew chapter 12. And Christ makes a clear distinction between a good tree or a corrupt tree. And in this instance, and in this context, in these verses, it clearly reveals that Christ uses the things of nature to teach and illustrate things of a higher nature pointing to the tree which is visible to the eye as the symbol of man and by their fruits you shall know them and by their words they reveal the condition of the mind and the heart so let's proceed and read from Matthew chapter 12 beginning with verse 33 to 37 and you can join me in your Bibles, with your Bibles. Open your Bibles and let us read this together. I always get this from the King James Version. Okay. Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse 33, Jesus said, either, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O oh, generation of vipers, the serpents and snakes, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Back to that illustration, a good man out of a good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, will therefore bring forth evil things. And then here's the warning. But I say unto you that every idle word, things that we don't need to hear, 
that we say. Every idle word that man shall speak, which comes from the heart. We just read that. They shall have to give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And verse 37 concludes this. For by your words you shall be justified. And also by your words thou shalt be condemned. So in that way we determine our eternal destiny. By the condition of our mind and our heart. For out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth will speak or bring forth either good fruits or evil fruits. So going back and, and continuing this study, we're told that none, we're told to search. Okay, the first thing we need to do is to search the word of God. Because therein is the righteousness of Christ revealed. And they are they which testify of me. This power of discernment. And so it's not just a friendly suggestion or even a wise counsel, it is a command. Because the word of a king is law. So God commands his people to judge. And from the previous messages we discussed, that word judge is in fact to search. And search with how? <laughs> not with our lips but with our minds, the mind of Christ, that is, in order that we may acquire the wisdom and know by discernment what the real, authentic, genuine, present, sealing truth is for these last days. And those who, for whatever reason, refuse to search the truth from the scriptures, just said that John five thirty nine, and not only that, there is a provision that is given by an example, and who are they? The early believers. Paul made a distinction between the Bereans from Berea and the Thessalonians from Thessalonica. They were both believers. But why was the former commended over the latter? Because if you read Acts 17.11, the Bereans were open. Their minds were open. Their hearts were open to receive the truth. They were not skeptical. They were not, you know, they, they didn't question right away. They were open, but it didn't stop there. These believers received the truth and then went home and did their homework. It says there in Acts 17, 11, after getting all this truth, or they, they obtained as much as they could. They went home and searched the scriptures, whether those things are really so. And that's the way we should proceed. If we possess the mind of Christ, in this body, which is the temple of the living God, we will also proceed on the same basis. Allow the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts through the living word, written word, so that it becomes the living word. And then we prove it and vet it, not by the opinion of opinions of learned men, but a thus saith Lord. It is written whether those things were so. So, the problem we have today is we're like robots. You've heard about bots. They're all over the place today. They're not alive. People think they are. They don't have life. But they move and act and make decisions. Very dangerous, it is. Okay. I was just reading where the people in the time of Christ, his own chosen people, had so learned the wrong way of ascertaining and determining truth. They ceased to exercise the individuality that they possessed, being created a free 
moral agent with a will. Instead, over the years, over the time elapsed from generation to generation, up to their own generation in times, in Christ's time, they were taught to ask a question, not Berean like, but their diagnosis of what was truth was framed and phrased in this manner. Have the Pharisees, have any of the Pharisees believed on him? Christ was performing miracles, preaching and teaching the truth. His own life was actually, he was the law in the flesh. Anything and everything about him was a magnification and a fulfillment of that prophecy in Isaiah 42, 21. He would magnify the law and make it honorable, not merely by words, but by actions and by deeds. And again, from out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth spoke, and they were words of life. What did he say there? In John 7, 48, many of them listened and saw Christ so God in the flesh. They were convicted. But what was the result? They were trained from childhood up to ask this question. Have any of the Pharisees believed on him? And you know what happened. That's history. They did not believe on him. They hated him. And so their salvation offered so freely, they lost it right then and there by the choice that they made. Let us learn those terrible lessons in righteousness. Because in Proverbs 28, verse 5, the wise man says, Evil men understand not judgment. We're talking about judging, discernment. But they that seek the Lord will understand all things. Proverbs 28, 5, we'll read it again. The wise man, remember there's a wise man and foolish man, there's wise virgins and foolish virgins. Evil man or foolish man understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Therefore they are wise in the things of God. And so the word search, what, why is there the word search? What does search actually mean? What does it imply? Why is it necessary? Well, from God's servant in Upward Look 252, to search means to look diligently for something that has been lost. That's a key word. Why are you searching? Because something was lost. And here we are told to search. And search for what? Search for hidden treasure. That should be exciting in the world, the real world out there. It should be. And it is. People are willing to lose their lives and spend billions of dollars just to find so-called hidden treasure. Here, the hidden treasure is of eternal value. Doesn't require money. It requires the heart and the mind, and the soul, and the strength, and the body. Search yourself for that hidden treasure, and that hidden treasure is called the pearl of great price, which we will study very closely. Because of the parables that Jesus taught, he used things of nature that were recognizable to teach the things that were profound in wisdom. From the known to the unknown, it's called inductive teaching. Search yourself for the hidden treasure because you and I cannot afford to be ignorant of the Word of God. And we are encouraged study the difficult passages which are found all over the parables and the prophecies. And guess what? You don't have to guess. This is what's obtained today. They don't want to study them. It says, says this, these are hidden truths. It's in fact the exact opposite. We're supposed to study the difficult passages. And the question is, how do we do it? 
Just like Isaiah says in Isaiah 28, 13, comparing verse with verse. <laughs> line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Because there's only one spirit that inspired the writings of the 66 books of the Bible among some 40 writers. Comparing verse with verse. And you and I, if we launch into this kind of search with this attitude and a mind and a heart and a desire, we will find that this, that scripture is the key, not the Pharisee, is the key which unlocks scripture. And anyone and everyone who will prayerfully and humbly study the scriptures in this way will go from their study wiser than when they first opened the Bible. That should tell us that is the reward. And so what, that, what should that lead us? To open the Bible more frequently with this attitude of search, and we will find. Why? The Bible was given not only for ministers, pastors like me, or learned men and scholars, not even close, because every man, every woman, and every child should read the Bible, the scriptures for himself, or for herself. The counsel is do not depend on the minister to read the Bible for you because this is the reason why the Bible is God's word to you and me. Let it speak to you. And if you will have ears that can hear, you will hear his voice by the Holy Spirit speaking to your conscience and to your mind, touching your heart. Again, from the Spirit Prophecy, Volume 4, 412. No one, none but those who have trained their intellect to grasp the truths of the Bible will be able to stand to the last great conflict. And it's already knocking on our doors. To every soul will come the searching test. And how will this searching test be? And what will it be? It's the question. Obedience. Shall I obey God rather than man? That decisive hour is even at hand. And this thing was written back in 1884. You know how close we are. So the question really is, are our feet, not the physical feet, but where we stand on, are we prepared to stand in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? The faith of Jesus is all in the New Testament of what Jesus taught and his example. That is the faith of Jesus. So instead of examining others, mm -hmm. That's the problem we have today. We're always looking for faults. We're fault finders. That is a very profound, th th that kind of a problem has to be uprooted, not merely cut down, uprooted from its roots because it is deeply entrenched in our, in our lives, in society. Fault finding. People are even monetizing it. They try to discover a hidden truth and then sell it. That's a work of Satan, by the way. Rather, we are to examine ourselves, to prove ourselves whether we be in the faith, the faith of Jesus. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 1 Corinthians 11, 28. Daily self-examination. That's not only once a week, not when you're in church, not when you're in Bible study, but when you're alone. Daily examine, it's the daily examination of self in the light of the scriptures by God's law 
is where Christians will fail of eternal life. Why? Because this is one thing that the truth can never deny. It is the most unpleasant and humbling experience to be shown from the infallible word of God by the conviction of the Holy Spirit that we are in fact in the unconverted mind and carnal state. In heart and mind, we are actually, as pointed out in the Laodicean message, which we went through in a midweek manner, which you can download on our website, is the Laodicean message, which is the diagnosis of the divine physician. He says, you don't know this? Let me tell you what it is, and let me show you what it is. You are actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Revelation 3.17 And the only antidote to the spiritual disease is provided for by the same warning and rebuke. It is a package. You can choose one and benefit from it. You have to embrace the whole thing because God is a wholesome God. They call it holistic. So this antidote to the spirit of the disease includes, and in fact, in a practical sense, a daily examination of self and then the daily dying to that. How? Through God's empowering grace. And the result is, that is having the mind of Christ and honoring our bodies from head to foot and everything in between as the temple of God and the Holy Spirit because it has been purchased by the blood of Christ. We'll, we will be able to come to this point only when we realize and appreciate that Christ, our high priest, who has actually borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, is now still pleading before the Father for us, and that his intercession will always point to his crucifixion. When we stop there, that is the problem. We need to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. From the cross, he died, he resurrected, he ascended, and then he entered into his closing work in heaven, in his person, in the incarnation, into the body, the flesh and blood body of humanity. And he is there now pleading for us. And what is his intercession really in? What is that value of the intercession? The power and the efficacy? Well, this is where the cross comes in and the evidence is there. His intercession is that of a pierced and broken body of a spotless life in sinless life, the wounded hands, the pierced side, the marred feet of Christ our Savior and example and intercessor is what is pleading for fallen mankind whose redemption has been purchased at such an infinite cost. There is no numbers to this cannot even be measured by eternity. So friends, look at this carefully. We have neglected this great truth that how we treat ourselves so carelessly and heedlessly and selfishly and claim to be followers of Christ. What a contradiction of, of sinners to God. He suffers for that. Your innermost thoughts and true feelings is what makes you you. Jesus said again in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, 
And we just read about the treasure of the heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You want to ask yourself or ask and inquire of others, what is my heart? Is my heart with you? Well, whatever you treasure, that is where your heart is. And so we can and we must assess ourselves honestly, accurately, divinely. And we don't need the help of so-called psychiatrists and psychologists or even ministers, pastors, priests, bishop, priests, or whoever they are. They have their own role. But in order to determine the truth about who we are, by Christ's estimation, which is the only thing that matters, we have to follow the rule that has been provided for us. And it reveals it is this simple. It's not very complicated as to who you and I really are. We are what our secret thoughts and feelings and motives and desires and tastes and preferences and ambitions are. This is the heart of man. So whatever and whomsoever we spend the rapidly dwindling time and money, look at the hourglass, and expend our energy, energies, by the way, it's all diminishing returns. We spend, we focus on and pay our attention to actually reveals our heart. That is our heart. And so these deep thoughts and imaginations, affections, which are part of the definition, the real definition of heart and mind we considered, is really what we need to be dealing with because that is what God is dealing with. Man looks on the outer appearance, talks about personality and looks. God looks upon the heart. It unmistakably tells you, tells me what we are really preparing for. Preparing for to eventually inherit whether it's the life here now, eternal life, or eternal death. There are only two roads to take. The straight and narrow, difficult, but leads to eternal life. The easy and broad way, pleasant, but ends in eternal damnation. It unmistakably reveals who of the only two masters in this world we are actually in heart and mind serving? Christ or Satan? If you want to know who Christ is, whom we cannot see, or Satan is, whom we cannot see, examine your hearts and mind. And by their fruits, you will know them. Jesus plainly said, no servant can serve two masters. We're all servants. But the masters are only two, one or the other. For either he will hate one and love the other. So this is the love-hate dichotomy. In this realm, it's either you're loving or you are hating. Either Christ or Satan. You cannot see them, but by their fruits. You will discern them. You cannot serve God and mammon. Luke 16, 13. For many who claim to be followers of Christ, that includes me and you, meaning we're Christians, are hopefully not presumptuously hoping to be saved and say they are saved and tell others that's the way to be saved. Believe only and that's it while maintaining this duality of servanthood. They are fearfully deceived. It is to such class of believers that Jesus 
address these fearful words which we have been repeating to our studies and sermons. He will say, I know you not. Depart from me. Almost exactly the same words that the foolish virgins heard when the bridegroom came out. They were not prepared. It says, if you read a parable, Matthew 25, they didn't only hear words. It says, the door was shut. That is forever. So in Romans 6, 1 to 23, you should read this whole chapter and study it for yourself. I'm just bringing it to your attention. We will find there where we are either under the power of grace that proceeds from God and thus obey God's law unto righteousness. That's, that's the effect of that, the fruit of that. Or we are under the dominion of sin, which proceeds from Satan. And I have understood this very clearly. Satan is very powerful. But how do we overcome him? Simple. When Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John, John 14, 15. What he was saying, if you keep the commandments, you cannot come under the dominion and power of Satan. That is the secret, friends. And so what did Satan do? Do away with the law. How strange the infatuation of those who still believe this. That's self-condemnation. We are either under the law of God, which results in righteousness, or we are under the dominion of Satan and sin, which reward and wages is death. The Apostle John, as we have been repeating over and over again, because they are so important and getting more vital, and soon its vitality will cease because probation would have closed. He says there, love not. There's love here, okay? But what kind of love? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Many of us say, may say, you know, in, as a hypocrite would do, and a fake one would say, and, and a fraud. I don't do this. That is when nobody's watching. But they do it in private, forgetting that a million billion eyes are watching. Evil spirits, good angels, and the unfallen world, and most of all, the Holy Spirit. That's why he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. In the world, but not of the world. Those are true Christians. Because if any man loves the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So how can we truthfully and honestly say, our Father who art in heaven, and pray and use his name when in our hearts we love the world and things of this world? How? Not in the judgment. You may do it here, I may do it here. But for how long? And all that is in the world, what is that? What does, what does that actually mean? It is explained in the passage. What does it mean to love the world and the things of the world? It says clearly, the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And what will happen to that? And all that is included in that. And the world passeth away with the lusts thereof that this thing offers. But on the other hand, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That is, the will of God is exercised by the will of man. And therefore, the mind of God and the mind of Christ is in that person. That is very plain. God's will or desire for his people and his bride-to-be 
is that they do not fall in love, become infatuated or obsessed with this fallen world. It is passing away with all its dazzling attractions, mesmerizing, friends. Dead, actually deceived means entranced, eh, entranced, <laughs> addicted, uh, abducted, and detained by Satan's snares. Because all of this will soon, as Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, verse 9 to 12, you need to read it. It says, all of this will melt with fervent heat, even the very elements. You studied that table in, in chemistry, right? All of that will even, even that will melt. Instead, what does he want? There's the other side. He wants us to love him because he first loved us. And not only that, the things that Jesus, by his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his intercession, has acquired for us. And for what reason and what purpose? To restore his character image of perfect righteousness. And then, and only then, will we be able to inherit that place. Some people say it's those mansions. I read it as that place. I really don't care if it's a mansion or not. doesn't matter. So long as I can be with him. Because it says that wherever I am, there you may be also. That is what he has got to prepare for all those who love him. John 3, 16. Read John 3, 16. John uh, chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. But also Paul adds to that. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for them that love him. So by what means can we actually determine on whose side we are on? That is a question each one should ask himself every day, every day. And this is the question we should ask. Who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Upon whom do we love to converse? That's why it says, by your words justified, by your words you're condemned. Who has the warmest affections and our best energies? If we are on the Lord's side, our thoughts are with him. And our sweetest thoughts are of him. We have no friendship with the world because we have consecrated all that we have and are to him and to him alone. And we long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, and do his will and please him in all things. That's from Faith I Live by 220. With that, let's close today's edition. In a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you are still speaking to us with your Holy Spirit. You are still interceding for us as our high priest. And the Holy Spirit is still taking our language and the words that can never reach the throne of grace, but with intercession, with, with groanings, muttering with groanings that we ourselves cannot exercise. They take these human words, translate them into divine words, and enter, and by the virtue of Christ's perfect righteousness, the incense that is covering those prayers, they enter into the throne of grace where Christ is interceding for us. Bless us now, O Lord, that we may comprehend this subject. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.